Michael, I understand from stalking you online a little bit. Yes, <laughs> yes. That a British film director discovered you while you were still in med school? Was uh, I was in dental school at the time. Um, discovered, that's a very funny word, isn't it? Uh, we met. I, I was in uh, at my favorite restaurant in New York called Lucky Strike. It was actually under the apartment that I ended up living at in Manhattan, uh, down on Grand Street. Um, I was having brunch with my uh, girlfriend at the time, a bunch of exes ago. Um, and yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's like, oh, are you an actor? I'm like, no, I'm actually a student um, uh, trying to uh, start a career in dentistry. And he was like, well, I have a, I'm a director and um, I've got a part in my film that I think you'd be right for. And as soon as I heard that, I'm like, listen, man, like I'm, I'm from New York. Like I, I hear crap all the time. It's like, whatever, you know? So I, I didn't really think anything of it. I looked him up. He was actually a legit film director <laughs> and working, you know, for like 20 years, did big, did big feature films. So I, uh, I called him and I, I ended up working with him personally for like a month or two months rehearsing for this role. Uh, I didn't get the role, but during that two month period when I was working with him and I was like, I, I like this. I really enjoy acting, and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this out. So I talked to my parents about moving to New York, and it, it just, I, I didn't look back. I, I, I stopped going to school, and uh, I started booking stuff, <laughs> and I, yeah, it worked out. What was that conversation like? Because I've heard others like from like comedian Brian Regan and things like that. I think he was in his last year in college, yeah. and he was going to be an accountant or somebody like that. And they had to give that conversation. Mom, Dad, I have something to tell you. My parents have always been supportive of me, no matter what, right? But the one thing was education. You get your degree no matter what. And I had my, my uh, bachelor's degree. I went to Hamilton College and got my degree in biology, and that was all great. But they are both professionals. Uh, my father's a doctor. My mother's a nurse. So, you know, you're going to be a professional because we are professionals, and this is what we want for you. We want you to be secure, and we want you to make a lot of money. That's not what they said to me, but yeah, they just, they worry, right? Parents worry. They want you to be stable and have what they didn't have, you know. Uh, but I told them, you know, I just want to try this out. Like, I, I don't, I just, I'm young. I, I, I have a, a liking to this and I think that I can do it and I like it and I, I want to try it. And um, I'm going to move to New York now. And they were very reluctant at first. Uh, and it wasn't until they started seeing me on television in commercials or you know, TV shows or whatever. And they were like, okay, so you're not homeless? Because, <laughs> you know, they worried. They, they worried, you know, they, they, in their mind, an actor was someone who would go to auditions and just fail. And they thought I was going to end up like in a gutter somewhere, probably. But, um, you know, they, they were just a smart boy. You know, I wasn't an idiot. I, you know, I could hustle. I, you know, I, I waited tables and I was able to make my rent every, every month. And uh, the rule was this. I said, here's the deal. The day I ask you for money, or the day I ask you for your help, where I'm really struggling and I can't do any more on my own, is the day I quit and I go back to school. And I've never asked them for anything. So, haven't had to ask them for anything yet. So, it's, uh, yeah, and hopefully I won't have to. If you were going to sit down another um, actor who maybe was on a path to do something else, and their parents, they were going to go meet their parents that weekend and have that quote unquote talk. Yeah. What would you tell them? What would be your advice to that person? You live once and you don't have that much time on this earth. If there's something you really want to do, I mean really want to do, like there's nothing else you can do except for this and it makes you that happy, you have to do it. And, and I think that's important for, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are unhappy in this world because they're doing things they don't like to do. And yes, they're probably financially secure, but they might be miserable. Is that really how you want to live the rest of your life? I don't know. For me, I, I couldn't do that. I've, I'm too much, I'm too stubborn for that. <laughs> so that would be part of the talk? If you were going to advise Jack or Jill, you know, blossoming artists, yeah. would that be part of it to like sit mom and dad down? Yeah, I, I just think you have to be honest mm -hmm. um, with yourself and with them. Tell them what you want to do. now. I want to do this on my own. I took the hard route. I didn't ask for anything. I didn't say, you know, can you finance my apartment? Can you pay for acting classes? Can you pay for this? I didn't ask for any of that because I wanted to be on me. This is my choice. I'm leaving a lucrative career in dentistry or, or medicine. 
where you know I did uh, get a degree in biology. You raised me to, to be a doctor, to be a professional, and I chose a different route. But I won't ask you for anything. I'll do it on my own. You know, it, 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 that's. I think it's easier for me to do that than to say I'm gonna I'm gonna choose this career in acting and to be an artist. But you can you pay for it? <laughs> that's a harder conversation. But I think I kind of put pressure on them. Um, because I wasn't asking them for anything. So it wasn't manipulative, but it was like, this is my choice. I love you and you're my parents, but I'm gonna do something different than what you're doing. But that's okay, I still love you and you love me and, we're, and you're still gonna be my parents and I'm still gonna support you and you're still gonna support me. But this is what I wanna do. Let's see what happens, you know? And it's been fine, they, they absolutely love it now and they support me and they're like my biggest fans, my only fans. <laughs> well, it sounds like you followed up though with action. Absolutely, I think that's probably the key thing. Well, yeah, I, I went to New York and I was like, "All right, acting. Let's go learn how to act." So I went to Terry Schreiber. I took classes at Terry Schreiber Studio for years. I got into every class I could. I started signing up for student projects, then independent projects, and then I got an agent and a manager, and you know, here I am today. Do you put a lot of pressure on yourself to make things happen? It sounds like you're probably a doer. I, I get that. You have to. There's too many actors in this business, too many good actors in this business, too many bad actors in this business to not tr do your best. Every day I try and do something. If there's not an audition or an opportunity um, coming up, what can I do to better my career? Whether it's updating a website, whether it's taking another class, whether it's go work on a scene, where, something to do that's creative that will help me because you have to be constantly getting better. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse, right? It's like, I was a big, a big soccer player in college and in, in high school. Um, and my philosophy was, you're only as good as your last game. You're only as good as your last practice, right? It's an athlete's mentality. So for acting, you're only as good as your last audition or your last you know, film. You could have an amazing movie, but let's say you do another uh, film or a TV show where the, it bombs and, and you know, you're not getting good reaction or good traction. Guess what? That's the last impression you're leaving with people. So you gotta bounce back. You know, so you have to be constantly getting better. My goal is to try and be doing something every single day creatively. It's hard, that's the hardest thing about acting, is that the jobs, there's not an audition every day. You're not gonna work every day steadily until you're at that level. Uh, so what do you have to do? You wanna write, you wanna try and do your own, own projects. That's the, that, that's the goal for me. Since that day that you had the talk with your parents and you decided to take that you know, course change from being a dentist to now acting, have you ever thought back about it? And no. Like, never? Never. It's never crossed your mind to go back? Uh -huh. No. There were a couple of times, uh, I remember I was waiting tables, uh, it was like a, it was in the middle of a double, and, I, and people were like throwing things at me. It's just, it, it's, sometimes waiting tables can be a terrible, miserable job. And uh, even then, I was like, should I, should I just stop right now, stop what I'm doing, go back? And, and then, and I was thinking about dental school and how much that kind of was terrible. I was like, no, I can deal with people throwing tacos at me. You know, I'll throw them back. It's just like I use that energy sometimes when it gets really bad, and I and I, I almost throw it right back at people where I put into an audition or I put into a, you know, uh, you know, character that I'm working on, and that that kind of, you know, eases the pain sometimes when you're going through rough times. And there are there are absolutely ebbs and flows in a career. You know, sometimes you're you're working every single day for five six months. Sometimes you can't get an audition. It's, it's crazy. So since you have that athlete's mentality, do you have an ability to say, okay, I'm now taking off my apron or my name tag or whatever. That Michael is done. That's just a role I play. And now I'm going back to my real life. And then what do you do to get yourself back on track? Because I've had those jobs too where you're just so down about what just happened. You have to do things that make you happy. When it's not in terms of acting, you have to go, for me, play soccer. If you like running, I hate running, but some people like to run, 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 run. You don't have an audition that week, run. Go do things to distract yourself that make you happy, but also better yourself. Running, athletics, these are all good things. They keep you in shape, right? Um, if you like to party, party, but that's where you can get into trouble because people get caught up in that and then they're not actors anymore. They're just people who pretend to be actors who are just partying all day and trying to network. Do you see that a lot? Um, I don't go out anymore. I, I, I'm completely focused on what's going on in LA since I moved here. I don't really go out. If I go out, it's you know with, with friends or um, 
people I like to hang out with like a close circle and um, I rarely drink because it's that's something that doesn't really help me anymore I did enough drinking in New York you know I party a lot in New York so it's here it's in LA for me it's work and being an artist and, and just bettering yourself as an actor do you remember the day that you had that decision because that's an amazing epiphany especially being young handsome I'm sure there's all these opportunities you get a lot of attention when you go out but then there is a flip side and then years can be wasted when I got here I realized what I was up against I got here what about a year ago and I saw how many actors were here uh, in New York I knew there were a lot of actors you know and you're you're competing with all those actors but here you're competing with probably ten times the amount of actors so what's your edge right you have to ask yourself how am I better than these people what's gonna make me stand out you have to look better you have to be a better actor you have to be everything and what is drinking really gonna do for me that completely goes against everything that I was doing so I was started to go to the gym I started to research more classes I started to surround myself with artists I joined a theater company and that's how I actually did that play trust which got some pretty good reviews in LA weekly recently so that that was a success because it was like I didn't have any auditions going on go take go join a theater company and good things came out of that so it's just constantly finding ways to better your career and going out and partying it, it doesn't really do much for me anymore when you came out here what was your plan to, with LA I mean you talked about earlier getting a reel together uh, a okay um, I've been trying to come to LA for four years actually before I actually moved here money was the issue and then I booked a couple commercials and I was blessed and very grateful that I booked them I took the money invested it and then I was able to move out here and I got here and, and I didn't know anyone out here and it was like okay talk to some people what's this what do I do <laughs> like you need to get a manager and I'm not gonna go into out I'm not gonna go into how I got one but um, I hustled and I was able to take a bunch of meetings and was able to gratefully sign with a really solid manager which then got me an agent and that happened only about three or four months after I got here so very lucky but it was all planned it was all like I'm gonna move to LA with my reel with a website with some credits with some heat and do this I did it the right way I, I, I when I first moved when I was first thinking of moving out here four years ago I didn't have enough on my resume I didn't I wasn't a good enough actor back then and I knew that and I was like I'm not gonna go to LA flounder around for five years and just be another number I'm gonna go there and show people stuff <laughs> and that's that's how it all went down and that's why gratefully I, I'm represented now so I can get have other people work for me to get work where were you when you got the call or the information about this supposed audition for this <laughs> Duracell power mat with Jason? Oh man, uh, it was at House Casting in New York, down in uh, the West Village, and I uh, I had an audition for this commercial, the Duracell power mat commercial featuring Jay Z. I went to the first audition, and it was just me, you know, with the cast director going over this scene where I hand him the phone, and there's some type of awkward moment that happens I was like oh sweet audition I'll never get it just because it didn't seem like it was my type I saw the other other actors in the room and and it just didn't seem like I don't know I just didn't, I didn't feel like I, I was gonna get this role you know it, it's weird some it's weird how sometimes you feel that and then those are the ones that you book it's crazy uh, I get a call and like you got a call back for the Duracell I'm like okay cool my agent you know called me I went back and uh, there was uh, Anthony Mandler Anthony Mandler is one of the biggest uh, music video and uh, creative directors in business in Los Angeles. He shot all of Katy Perry's uh, music video, music videos, uh, a lot of Lana Del Rey, Rey's music videos. I had no idea who this guy was, but he he sits there, interviews me, and um, the callback went well. And I got a call like the next day, like you booked Duracell, and I it didn't really hit me until I was on set, you know, like a week later, and Jay Z is there. Um, in the room and we're doing a scene together and I was I was like what you know I don't get starstruck I really don't I, I see actors a lot and you know you meet a lot of celebrities out here in New York but Jay-Z is a force man that guy is just I mean who wouldn't want to be Jay-Z 
music, clothing. I mean, he just, he owns a basketball team. The guy was the man. I was a little starstruck, but he was really cool. Talked to me like a normal dude. Uh, and that's what I think's great about him. He's humble. Um, but I was thinking later, I mean, he can be humble. He doesn't have a worry in the world. He's married to a beautiful, <laughs> a, you know, beautiful girl, beautiful, talented girl. He's got all the money. It's like, why does he have to, he doesn't need to be, you know, conceited or cocky at all because he's got it, you know? Just a charming, uh, awesome guy. Very grateful. And I took, I was able to take the money from I, that I made from those commercials and um, was able to move to Los Angeles. So... I didn't realize how much money you can make from uh, these national commercials. They're pretty awesome. So hopefully I book another one soon. They weren't a buyout? Well, no, 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 no. Most, okay. most national uh, network SAG union commercials are not buyouts. Okay. Um, so do you remember being on set? Like how many hours and... Oh yeah, we shot the whole day. Uh, the commercial, it's funny. Jay-Z's only in about three or four seconds of the commercial. I'm in like like three quarters of it, which is crazy. It was basically just a camera following me around the city with my cool power mat charger, you know, being cool and, and, and you know, sending texts and being a city guy. I think they had me being like a graphic designer. They had me in these cool clothes. I still have clothes from that shoot. I still wear them because that was the epitome of me being cool. <laughs> and they let me keep some of the clothes. I still rock some of the, the, those outfits. Um, but they, had, they followed me around New York and then uh, we get to the club and uh, the whole scenario is I accidentally pick up Jay-Z's phone. I pick it up and it says B is calling. I'm like, B. And then Jay-Z comes in. He's like, and I'm like, who? Oh. <laughs> Very funny, awkward moment. And the, the commercial did well. And um, yeah, it was cool to say that I was in that. I was really grateful to be in it. So do people recognize you? Um, a few people. Not, not many. Um, because they're, you know, they're paying attention to Jay-Z. <laughs> it's not like when you're watching the commercial, like, who's this guy? And then they see Jay-Z, it's like, oh, Jay-Z's in that commercial. They're not really remembering the guy that's handing the phone. But you are in, like you said, a good three quarters. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. But Jay-Z, Michael Galante. <laughs> <laughs> if I have one ninetieth of his uh, power and uh, force, uh, at, at, you know, at the, at the uh, height of my career, I will die a happy man. <laughs> Michael, you said you weren't going to come to LA until you had that acting reel. Yeah, there were a few things that I, I made a list of things I needed before I went to LA. One was a better resume, <laughs> so I went and got some credits. Two was an acting reel, because I knew how many actors were out here. I didn't know exactly how many actors were out here, but I knew that there were a lot more than New York. <clears throat> so. I was, in my mind, I was like, how am I going to stand out amongst this whole sea of actors, beginners, advanced, you know, whatever. How am I going to stick out and be noticed by a manager or an agency? Well, get a reel. Make a reel. Make a, a highlight tape of stuff you've done so you can show people. Because guess what? A headshot is a headshot. It's a picture of you. I could, you know, you could take a picture of some guy walking down the street, call it a headshot, and he can say, I'm an actor. Sag after, he could be lie and say, it doesn't really do much. Unless you look like Brad Pitt. You know, I don't look like Brad Pitt. So how do I differentiate myself? I have to show my acting talent. How do you do that? Invite people to a show? Yeah. Are people going to come to them? Probably not. Maybe. You know, maybe you get lucky. You get, you know, maybe out of 20 emails, you send to cast directors who want to come to your your showcase, maybe you get one that comes. But how can I effectively send out a package with all my stuff in it that everyone will at least have the access to? Not necessarily click on, because you, you get spam every day. You get an email from someone, oh, I'm in this thing, okay, delete. But what if you package it with a reel, a resume, a website, and all your contact information and your pictures on one web page? What if you do that? So the goal was make a website, have your reel on it, have your photos, have news, like a news feed of what stuff you're doing to say, hey, here I am, here's all my stuff, take it or leave it. And I was gonna, and I did that. Literally the day before I left LA, I launched my website. And I, I did that on purpose to just have a, what do they call it? Like a barrage, not a barrage, but have a, uh, I don't know the word, 
Um, Almost like a day and date of you coming out to LA. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but to have like, just like, um, I'm not finding the, the, the word, but just, I wanted to make it a, a, an all-in-one assault, almost like an assault of Michael Galante. Not bits and pieces, not, you know, it's all, who is this kid? He's brand new. No one really knows him, but here's his stuff. And it worked. I got here. I sent out all these emails to all these managers with the real, the resume, the website, all professionally done. Thank God for my creative team because I can't do this stuff. I wasn't. I didn't make my website. I didn't make my reel. I had. I had an amazing team of friends, really talented friends, who did this for me. They're professionals at what they do, but they also happen to be friends. So let's go back because that sounds great, a creative yeah. team. But how did you? So you knew so-and-so did websites, you knew so-and-so did reels. How many times did you meet with them? What oh, did God. you express to them about? The reel was a two, three year process. Oh, that mm -hmm. long, okay. Of getting clips together, going through them, highlighting what, what we're gonna use, what we're not gonna use. I had, you know, yeah, I had two editors working on my reel. Then I had a graphic designer to make a website, which I paid for, you know, in full, but he was a friend I played soccer with. Really talented guy extremely talented people and these people were able to make me you know package me in this one on a website mm -hmm. and make me look marketable and that's what you have to do you have to do that because there's too many actors out there to, to just come to LA and say go to a manager and say hey here's my uh, here's my headshot I'm working on my reel right and I think when you when you show all that at the it also sends a message that you know you get work done or you kind of do what you say you're going to do. It's complete. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you know, yeah, are your credits, are you working on you know, X-Men 4? No, maybe not, but you're at least, you understand what the business is about by doing that. Because you're, you're, you have to, it's a business. You have to be a marketable human being, right? You have to appeal to the masses. How do you do that? You have to at least have a portfolio that can, can you know, get to a lot of people. So I thought the website w w would do that w with a reel that packages me, you know, into one, it's just clicking. You know, it gave them, it, gave, it made it, I made it very easy for managers and agents to access what I've done. And I think actors, they don't do enough of that. So when you got here, how did you get access to those people's information? IMDB. I went on IMDB Pro which you can pay for. It's like, I don't know, 60 bucks a month. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this. Uh, uh, this is very good information, <laughs> actors out there. And I went, yeah, I'm just gonna do it. I went through, you can actually sort through on IMDb Pro and rank the managers and agents. One, two, there's like 20,000 of them. And I went through for three weeks Three weeks, stayed in my apartment, had a glass of wine occasionally just to relieve the stress and tension, and went through and sorted out who, who whose contact info I, I have, because sometimes they don't list. You know, sometimes the emails are there, sometimes they're not. I emailed everybody anyway, I didn't care, because my mentality was I have nothing to lose. And I went through and I emailed the top 100 managers in Los Angeles, and I got responses. And a lot of them were funny. They were like, uh, we don't usually do this, but would you take a meeting with us? I'm like, yeah, of course I would take a meeting with you. And uh, I was fortunate to take uh, about eight meetings and got uh, offers from about from four people and I signed with, um, with one, which is the best one. And this is in, within how much time? Four months. Four months. How long was, the, was this email and what did it say? Uh, it was one page. And it was extremely candid and honest. Hey, my name is Michael Galante. Here's my reel. Here's my resume. Here's a website. Here's some photos. I would love to work with you. Let me know what you think. It was extremely honest and just to the point. There was no BS. It, I didn't really talk about myself. You know why? Because the website did it. The reel did it. That's the beautiful thing about a reel. When you have that, you don't have to talk about yourself. Because once you start talking about yourself, People tune out. Come on, I mean, we're on the street and you're, you start talking about yourself and you hear someone talk, it's like, okay, you could be telling the truth or you could not be telling the truth. You know, you don't know. You have no idea. You can't fake a reel. 
it's there. You press play and those are images of you on a show or in a commercial. That's not, that's not BS. So I was, it was all planned out. So you said the reel was what, two years in the making? Yeah, well no, if you think about it, it was all the time I was in New York, about five, six years in the making. I took all the footage, compiled it into, my reel's kind of long, five minutes. It's a great reel. It's funny though, isn't it? Six years of work into five minutes. And so what made you choose certain scenes? Well, I hired a, my editor, Mark Odgers, who's one of the most talented people I know in this world. And he, he was like, use this, don't use this, this is terrible, this is good, we're gonna use this. He just turned it into, made it into like a little, little movie. And that's what people watched when I sent out to managers and agents. And they were like, okay, okay, I'm gonna call this kid. Going back to that reel, <clears throat> I hear a lot of actors say, you know what, I'm having trouble getting this spot from this one director or for this one project, whatever. Oh. Did you encounter any of that? And oh. How did you work through Oh, that? I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> Let's I'm going to be very candid about this. <sighs> one of the hardest things to do as an actor, especially beginning, and you're doing student projects or independent projects, is to get footage from directors. Um, and there were times when I didn't receive footage. I'd work two weeks, three weeks, you know, long days on a project, and they wouldn't give me my footage. And I was seeing a pattern of this, especially in the first few years of doing this, and I was like, oh, no, 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 this is bullshit. I would send a barrage of emails, phone calls, texts, and be like, you owe me this is footage. I did this for almost like low to no pay. What I did this for was experience, and for you, to give me my damn footage. I would harass people. Oh, I would say, I'm coming to your house and I'm gonna take it off your hard drive because they owe you that. You know, directors, you know, I love directors, but some of them take advantage of actors, especially if they're not paying you. They're using your, your talent for their film. That is your work though, and they owe you that. So get your footage. You deserve it, you earn it, and you need to use it to show people. It's not gonna do anything on someone's hard drive. Nice. Yeah. I feel very strongly about this because I've had mm -hmm. lots of run-ins with directors. And that's your work. I mean, that is your work. Get it and use it. So we understand that you have some very strong tips on how to not just get in the business but stay there. You've talked to a lot of actors. Yeah, I would consult actors, beginning actors in New York. Uh, some of them would be like, how did you do this? How did you get the Jay-Z commercial? How did you get an agent? How did you... And I, I would give them tips, you know. But the first tip is this, go get good at acting. <laughs> go take a class, go take multiple classes, go do improv, just go get good at acting because that's how you're gonna book work. You're gonna go into the room and you're gonna kill an audition and that's where you're gonna book work. Unless you're a ridiculously looking, good looking person and you just go in and just someone wants to sleep with you and yeah, you're gonna book work doing that too. But if you really wanna be a working actor in this business, Go get good. So call the best teachers, call the best acting coaches, and go work on your craft. The next thing is, go be marketable. Meaning, present yourself in a marketable way. Get an acting actor reel. It, when you have footage, how do you get footage? It, if you don't have an agent or a manager, go do student films. This is a perfect opportunity to go practice what you're working on. And actually, the pressure is low to know. It's like you do a student film and you, you don't do well in it. Guess who's going to watch it? Nobody. Okay? The students are going to watch it. So go practice your craft at doing, you know, independent stuff. Um, a lot of people, it just irks me when people are like, oh, that's a student film. I'm not going to do that. You're not, oh, oh really? You're not going to do that? Because who are you again? Like, who are, are you like some like working actor who can turn down work? No. You're gonna do that student film because you're not a good actor, or maybe you are a good actor, but you still need the practice. Do not turn down work. It's an opportunity. You should be grateful. There are millions of actors out there who don't do, who don't work at all. You know, that student film that was offered to you, that role, make the most of it. Try something new. You know, ri take risks. Ugh, God, I just get frustrated sometimes with actors who say they're actors and they, are turning down work because there's no money. There's no money. 
In the beginning, there is no money. You're not doing this for money. You're doing this because you love it and you want to get better. And it's inspirational. You're not doing it because, you know, the student film only pays you $50 a day. Give me a break. Even that, $50 a day to, to what? To act? Awesome. Ugh. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, tips. So, go get a good acting coach. Go get better at acting. Uh, do student films, you know, to, to make stuff for, uh, for your reel. Uh, what else? And surround yourself, uh, surround yourself with artistic people who are like you and love, love the art. Because if you surround yourself with people who are, have the like, are like-minded as you, you're going to get better. I probably have, I could say, four or five actor friends. And all of them have the same beliefs that I do about acting. And it's, it's we do it or we die. It's like, I, I want to do this for the rest of my life. But there's not, no other option. And that's, I don't know, and, we're, we're, and they're creative and brilliant. And you want to surround yourself with, with people who are better than you or more talented with you than you. Because then you get better. You rise to their level. And um, yeah, there's a lot of actors I look up to and I aspire to be like. Well, are there different tips for New York actors versus LA actors? Uh, I, I think it's the, the same. My experience from being here a little bit is there's a lot more, oh, I don't want to say this the wrong way. In New York, there, there's no real fake. You can't fake it in New York. Because if you fake it in New York, you're going to have to leave New York. Because the rent's higher. You know, you, you just you can't afford to, to fake it in New York. You have my experience from being in LA for this small uh, amount of time is that there's a lot of LA actors who call themselves actors who are not really actors. They're not even trying. They just call themselves actors. In New York, there's a lot of actors who are are actors who are really in classes every single day, hustling and hustling and hustling, and really trying to be creative. Where here, it's a lot of people are trying to be famous rather than trying to work. Because the opportunities here, there's a lot more opportunities here. There really are. There's a lot more work here. It's one of the reasons why I moved here. A lot of theater here. People say that theater here in LA is, is terrible. How, how, who are you to judge that? Work is work. Make the most of it. You know what I mean? If you're not working, go join a theater company. There's a bunch of them in North Hollywood. I just... Art is art to me, you know, and uh, it's not all about film and television. Theater is great. New York theater is some of the best art in the world. Um, LA theater is is fine, <laughs> you know, it's work. What are some of the things you've done to find different LA theater companies? Oh, I researched, as soon as I got here, I was like, well, don't have a manager, don't have an agent, don't really want to pay for an acting class right now because I didn't have much money. Uh, go join a theater company. And from that theater company, I was cast in a play that... Um, had a great run and it got me some reviews in LA Weekly. So that was that was great. It was uh, Trust by Theater Unleashed, my theater company. It was a great cast, great production, and it, it was awesome. It was like a, I treated it like a, a fantastic acting class and an opportunity to meet other great actors and perform in front of people. Like, that's what real actors do, right? I want to talk about when you go in to meet with a casting director or a potential agent and when they try to see you as a certain type or role or ethnicity. Yeah. Any stories from that that you can share? My first guest star role uh, was last year uh, for Rizzoli and Isles, and I was cast as a Latino guy, Alberto Santana on Rizzoli and Isles. I don't really speak much Spanish, but I can wing it, and I know some words, and I, I made it work. But, you know... I think my agency and my and my my management and I I, I look Latino and and I am have an ambiguously uh, an ethnically ambiguous look to me and I've come to terms with that and that's fine, uh, but y you get in that room with a direct cast director and yeah you feel judged, they're looking at you like is he Latino enough I, I I can see it sometimes in their eyes like is he Hispanic enough to play this Hispanic role of Julio or Carlos, you know, um, so there's two sides to that. It's great that I'm getting called in for those roles because I'll tell you what, I have a better chance at booking a Hispanic role or a multi-ethnic role than a white role 
uh, a Caucasian role because guess what? The, the roles, the, 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 the pool for actors for just a regular, you know, 5'11", good looking Caucasian dude is ridiculous. I can't imagine. I, you know, I probably wouldn't get called in. I probably wouldn't get called in. So do I have an advantage because I have to deal with a smaller actor's pool and compete with that when that pool? Absolutely. But there's less lead roles for, for you know, multi-ethnic, ethnically ambiguous Hispanic actors, right? Um, so that kind of sucks. So there's a flip side to it. Would I love to be going out for lead roles in, you know, studio films? Of course, but I don't know if that's, you know, it's a business. And if you actually read a great article last week, and I think the percentage of, I'm half, I'm, I'm part Asian too, my mother's Filipino. And it's the, the percentage, it broke down the percentage of actors and their ethnicities in studio films. And I think it was like, Caucasian was like 65 to 70. Uh, African American was like 10%. And then like Hispanic Latino was like 5%. And then Asian was like 3.4%. And that's scary and um, kind of disturbing, you know? And, it, and that's a stat that kind of goes against what I'm trying to do, right? You look at that and you're like, well, that's me. So I'm up against kind of the studios and up against the numbers. But then, you know, an hour later I was like, oh, I'm going to... I'm going to fight that. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll push through. I'll be fine. But it's kind of a scary stat to see that, you know, minorities are still not getting the opportunities that the white people are getting. But uh, Well, when people ask you what you are, maybe they don't. Yeah. So, but how do you fight through that? Because why don't they just see you as they want to see you and cast you in that role? Right. Because, I mean, if you look at me, you might think, oh, this guy's Latino. When I speak, I, I, I speak like a, you know, like an American kid, Right. Um, what was your question? Well, I mean, do, I don't, what do they say to you? When you walk in the room, do they say, hey, are you, you know, I mean, what, what's the conversation? So where are you from? Mm -hmm. they ask, where are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm from New York. They're like, no, where are you from? <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, my background is so-and-so. And then they ask, so how's, how's the Spanish? And I'm like, you know, not that strong. <laughs> I'd rather be like strong to quite strong. But it, it's not, and that, it definitely hurts me, you know, sometimes, because they're like, well, you know, we, we need someone that speaks Spanish, so that's why my manager is thinking of buying me Rosetta Stone. <laughs> have you ever, have you ever fl just flat out said you're Latino? Just uh, that you think that that's what they want from you, and you want them to see you as that? Have you ever gone A couple times, direction? Yeah. because that's what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So how am I going to give myself, you know, a better chance to get the job? You have to say stuff like that. And it's not completely lying because Filipino actually is derived from, there's a lot of Spanish uh, influence in the Filipino culture. Right. So I'm not completely lying. True. That's um, true. Yeah. What's your advice to other um, ethnically ambiguous actors? I know there was a great post on BuzzFeed, but it was a comedy post about mm -hmm. what never to ask someone yeah. that's there you're never sure and they and they did this great video but a lot of it there was a lot of truth in it yeah so people are like so you're you're what are you and then you're just like you just wait right <laughs> um, I get the same thing yeah I mean but that's a good thing too they're asking that it is if, if they're asking that they're interested you know and I think that's good for TV you know you want people to be like what is that girl what is that guy who you know that's a good thing at the same time there's a smaller percentage of actors who are multi-ethnic and you know ethnically ambiguous so there's a flip side it's good that I'm competing with a smaller group of actors but the opportunities are definitely less I believe it's getting better there's no doubt it's getting better and there's always disclaimers on the audition sides and audition pieces at the end it says NBC is not exclusive, is, is always uh, cast from a diverse, we do not discriminate. It says that on all the audition sides. It's like, ah, eh, not really because you're looking for a white dude right now. <laughs> and um, yeah, I go in a lot for, for Latino and... Um, do you yeah. not, then on your, um, you know, all the interests, oh, you know, roller skating and all this stuff, and then do you put in terms of what your look is, or do you just let them guess that on their own? My manager told me something, and she's like, let them, let them worry about it, mm -hmm. let them guess. You just be you, you just be 
who you are, and they'll they'll figure it out. And if they are trying to figure it out, it means they're interested. Oh, that's good. Do you know what he, that's what, yeah. he, what he said? Leave it to them. I actually had uh, half Filipino, half Italian on my IMDb um, biography. He goes, take that down immediately. Really? Because I think he said it because he didn't want me to exclude myself from Latino, so that Latino, you know, if they're looking for a Latino role, they're like, oh, well, we can't take him. He's Italian and Filipino. That's not Latino. Let them judge you, you know, which is, this business is, it, it, it's what it is. They, the cast writers are looking at you like, not as a person, they're looking at you as, is he a Latin guy for this role of Carlos? Is he, it's just, it's the way it is, you know, because it's a lot of money involved. And they're, they're marketing themselves to a specific customer. They really are. It's just, it's just what it is. It's, it's, it's the evil, but it's what you have to deal with as a professional actor. Man in a Box by Kevin Eugene Davis. Is mm -hmm. this your first leading role? In a no, film? no, I've had uh, I've had other leading leading roles in mm. feature films. Um, um, do you remember how you were offered the role? Yeah, actually, my friend Warren Bob, who plays uh, Sonny in the film, uh, is a friend of mine, and uh, we worked together on a, on a bunch of projects, a couple of plays. Uh, a couple other films that we'd done, and uh, he called me and he was like, you know, they need a, they, they, their lead dropped out or they, they need a lead um, for this film. And I was like, oh really? Are they? I mean, are they auditioning? They're like, well, they're they need somebody now. I'm like, really interesting. What well, could you send me the script? Um, and the the director kind of knew of me before Kevin knew knew of me, and uh, he sent me the script and I read it and I was like, yeah, I'd like to get involved in this. Is that cool? And um, he kind of, I think he saw some of the stuff I've done or he checked my stuff out on IMDb or something and then offered me the role straight up. I actually never auditioned for it, wow. which is interesting. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. So that <laughs> Sorry, Kevin. great. That yeah, 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 yeah. I had, a, yeah. I had a reel uh, before the most recent one and I think he saw that and was sold that I could play Ryan. Um, so that's how it, how it kind of went down. And then... I went to the table read and then I was on set shooting this movie. <laughs> and where did they shoot it? Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Wow. Okay. It's about a two and a half hour drive from New York City. And how long were you there? Uh, we shot, I would total of, oh wow, it was like three weekends. Three, it was like total of like nine, ten days shooting. We'd drive, we'd leave the city on like Friday, shoot. You know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe Monday, and then drive back to New York. That was for about three or four weekends in a row. And when you're preparing uh, for your scenes, are you kind of by yourself, or do you prefer to be amongst people? Do I like to rehearse with my scene partner to go over beats, different moments, you know, uh, in the scene. Um, I do like to be on my own, too, going through my own intentions and things that I want to do and achieve in the scene. Any funny stories from the set that you could share? Oh God, it was so long ago. I'm sure there. Oh man, you know there were a bunch of bloopers and mishaps. Obviously, there's always that stuff on on set, which is funny with the crew, or you know, some of the improv was hysterical. That me and Chelsea Marino had. She played my fiance, Caitlin. There, uh, Kevin really let us go a few times. There was a dinner scene. We were drinking wine, fake wine, and. Uh, it was kind of sexual. There were some sexual undertones there, and uh, he let me really go, which was fun. And I think we did like maybe 13, 14 takes of, of but it was, it, it was all different. You know, it, it was great. And also the scene where, so Ryan, he finds drugs in this church that he's working at. He's supposed to install security cameras in this church. He stumbles upon all this cocaine, and he's like, well, I'm gonna sell this. You know, this is the whole, this is how he gets all kind of in trouble with the, the, the mob. Uh, and he, and he go, goes to meet a drug dealer. <laughs> now, Ryan is a regular kind of like, not uppity, not, not a yuppie type per se, but more of an upscale, you know, comes from a good family. <laughs> uh, and he's not like a thuggish, you know, he doesn't associate with drug dealers on a daily basis. So the scene where I go to meet the drug dealer to make the drug deal with Chelsea, Caitlin, my fiance, was one my favorite scene in the film because it's me in a diner. We're meeting this drug dealer who they picked a great character. His name is C. I think in his in real life his name was C too. 
Um, don't quote me on that. But he was like this big Hispanic, tough, just his like hysterical actor, great character actor, and he he was so scary and just a lot of times I would I would try and speak to him like you know here we have the drugs like so how's this gonna go down and he just wouldn't say anything <laughs> and me and I'm sitting there you know just really scared because this is a we're in a shady neighborhood he could pull out a gun at any moment we're trying to get money out of this guy who could probably kill us you know it's me and my beautiful fiance here and it made for a very very comedic scene and I think you should I hopefully it'll it'll, it'll turn out great. Michael, have you ever had a disappointing audition that actually led to acting work and also vice versa? One where you nailed it and you never heard back? Oh, God, yeah. The, the second one that you said happens all the time to me. <laughs> but my first uh, Law & Order uh, appearance, uh, I thought I bombed the audition. I went in there, I was nervous, it was my first audition for them in New York. Uh, and I, re I went in, I was nervous, I, w I, I was prepared, but I was just way nervous because it was my first time in front of these people. And I left the audition and I actually called my, my parents and I was like, I bombed it, this is awful. I was like depressed for like, like, you know, like the next few hours, I was like, this is terrible. Like, why, what am I doing? It was my first like, you know, year in New York trying to act, uh, trying to, you know, be an actor. And uh, I got a call the next day and they're like, you booked it, they love you. <laughs> they love you. And I didn't understand. I was like, what? What is this? What is this business? You know, and it's like they were actually looking for a nervous, young police officer to play the role. And I guess that's what I came off as. So they, they booked me. Insane. And I, and I was able to do it. It was a principal role with uh, Jeremy Sisto and Anthony Anderson. It was my first principal role uh, on a TV show. Ridiculous story. So from that day, what is that? That must have changed your whole perception about oh, yeah. your life and just you don't know. You, know. you just you be prepared as much as you can. You go in these rooms and you do your best. You never know what they're looking for because there have been auditions when I've been so prepared, maybe even over prepared, crush the audition, and they're like, they're looking for a black guy, or you're, you know what, that you were not Latino enough. So you here's what you can control in that room, and this is a good tip for actors. You can only control what you can control, which is your acting talent. You can't worry about how tall you are. You can't worry if your eyes are the right color. You go in there and you make a fan. You go in there and you try and do the best work that you can. You know, that, that's, that's all you can do. And there have been multiple times this past pilot season, I had some amazing callbacks. Some of the best auditions I've had in Los Angeles thus far. And uh, yeah, I didn't book it. but. After I got that call from my manager that said I didn't book it, it bothered me for about five minutes. And I was like, I, I can't be upset. There was nothing else I could do. There was nothing else, no other acting choices I could have made that could have you know, gotten me the role or not gotten me the role. It was the best that I could do. And that was a good feeling actually. It was actually a good feeling. It was like, you know what? They missed out, whoever you know didn't book me. It's like. I did my best and that's all, that's all you can do is your best. But make sure you're doing your best because you know, you know when you're not doing your best. You know when your work is like you were underprepared, you flubbed the line because you weren't really off book. You got to go in there and be 100% confident that you're giving your best because guess what? If you're not, the next guy is and that's the guy that's going to book the role. What's being overprepared? Oh, rehearsing the scene too much. That's happened to me before. Uh, for my auditions, I get an acting coach. I hire, I have two acting coaches I work with for every single audition I go on. And there are times when I go in there and, and I'm ready to work with them and I'm overprepared, too rehearsed, where it's not organic. You know, you can, there's, being off book is great, you know, but being off book to the point where you're not anticipating or you're anticipating the other person's lines is no bueno. It's got to be organic. So, you know, if, if I read that script, a billion times and did the scene with you a billion times when I get to the audition it's gonna look robotic it's not gonna be fresh and fun and it's what they want you know they want a fresh fun compelling scene so if I threw out a line could you mimic what overprepared would sound like like um, um, honey how was work 
<laughs> no, it's more like if you said that line to me mm -hmm. and I responded inorganically. Like, say it. Honey. It was great. Oh, that doesn't work because you didn't even get to finish your sentence. That's being you. overprepared. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yes, good analogy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So in those early days when you made that decision and had mm -hmm. your conversation with your parents, was it easier to book um, acting work or modeling work or two different animals? Modeling work, um, primarily because I had a modeling agent before I had an acting agent in New York. So they were able to get me out and uh, get me print jobs and some, some commercial stuff. And that paid the bills. And that was a blessing because that, was, that gave me the ability to go take an acting class and not wait tables. You know, it gave me time to go work on a scene with someone instead of wait tables <laughs> so that, that was that was that was a blessing and the, the modeling work is it's easier it's there's no lines you're trying on clothes you're looking pretty it's not it's not really that hard the acting work is the stuff that takes time and effort and is a, a lifelong journey whereas modeling is you either look good or you don't look good or you look right for some campaign or you don't you know it's very kind of you go in there and they book you or they don't. It's not, you know, it's not acting. Are there different modeling looks for LA versus New York? I don't know if there's modeling in LA. I haven't really done any modeling. I booked a Corona print ad, which is which is cool, but I feel there's more modeling in New York. And that's one thing that kind of sucks about LA, but I came here to act, I'm not here to model. You know, I didn't really go to New York to model in the first place. I happened to book a few modeling jobs and some commercial stuff, which is great. But I, I didn't move to New York to be a, a, a model. <laughs> How did that happen in New York? What? The, the modeling. That's interesting. Um, this is a secret. I was a working fit model for seven years in New York City. I don't know if you know what a fit model is. People automatically think it's like fitness modeling. You know, you're shredded, you're, you're lifting weights, and you're on, on covers of magazines. So a fit model is someone, your shirt, for instance, who is it designed by? Whatever. Yeah, Karen Clothing, right? So when Karen Clothing made that that blouse or that shirt, they before they can actually produce it and put it in stores, they have to fit it on somebody. Okay, so let's say Gap made this T-shirt. I used to work for Gap, so I can say that. Gap made this T-shirt, right? So if they want to sell it, they have to try it on a fit model, size 32, about 5'11", 170 pounds, and they have to try every single piece of clothing on that standard fit model. I was lucky for some reason. Apparently, jeans fit me perfectly, and, and I'm, a, I'm a, like apparently a perfect size 32. So I was able to do that with a bunch of a bunch of fit modeling clients in New York, which paid a ridiculous amount of money. So I was able to pay my bills doing that. Wow! How very did, lucky. Very lucky. How did you get that gig? I went. My my agency was like, "You ever do fit modeling?" I'm like, "I'm not really that jacked." They're like, "No, dude, it's not." about fitness it's like you try and close I'm like okay I got my first my first client plug jeans and they hired me and was paying me by the hour a ridiculous amount of money and it was steady because it's like they look at the jeans they don't fit they're like what's wrong with these jeans I'm like well they suck they suck here they suck here this doesn't fit this doesn't fit okay they take the jean they send it to China get it fixed adjusted send it back all right we need Michael again try on the jean again and they did that with every single piece of clothing so it was steady work it's not many people know about the industry but it's and some of the you know who makes the most money the plus size girls forget it they're getting paid three hundred dollars an hour so how does someone find those jobs go find a modeling agency in new york that does that i actually was lucky to stumble upon one and i had good people working for me so uh, they were able to get me at one point i had about nine or ten pretty top clients using me for uh, for denim and for, for tops, mostly denim. Apparently, my ass is perfect for jeans. I, I don't know, man. It was really awkward my first, uh, the, when I was doing the fit modeling, because it was just like, they're like touching you, and it's like, really, is this, is this what this happens? Really? Did yeah. you feel like a piece of meat? Or Absol like, oh, know? absolutely, but you know, it's, I had fun with it. I just, sure. I had fun with it, and they were sure. paying me, so I was like, shut your mouth, and you let them, you know, <laughs> if they touch your knee in a weird area, and it makes you laugh, you deal with it. Right, but then eventually you progressed, and they wanted to see all of you. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. absolutely. then they're like, oh, well, you're, you look decent in, in tops, too, so I did that. I don't know, I guess I should thank my parents. They, they gave me a perfect yes, size body. Thank them? Yeah. I don't know, thank you, mom and dad. <laughs>